Hey there, fourth graders. I am reading to you from my bedroom today because Mr. Jackman is working and on the phone downstairs. So he was kind of being noisy. So I'm going to read to you. So I'm sitting here in my bedroom against my bed. Uh, you can see my bathroom over there. I haven't put my robe away yet. It's kind of messy in here. So you just have to ignore all my messiness. I bet your rooms are messy too because I know my kids are messy at home. So maybe I'll clean my room when I'm done reading to you. So we are ready for our next chapter, which is called The Spy. So reading from Mystery on Mackinac Island, The Spy. At home, after a quick lunch, Hunter slipped the strap from the glasses from his neck and set out. High in the branches, he heard the tsee tsee of a red start. Soon he saw the tiny black and red warbler as it darted nervously from tree to tree. He was so intent that he hardly noticed when the bird led him across the road and then back to the haunted house. Suddenly a voice said, Hey, Hunter! Hunter lowered his binoculars and saw Kirby Tyson standing by the porch. His dray was nowhere to be found. How did you get here? The boy asked. On my bike, came the answer. This is my Sunday off. I've been checking some clues on those stolen bikes. Stopped for a smoke. Then pointing to the glasses, he asked, where did you get those fancy binoculars? Hunter tried to speak, but he couldn't. Never mind, Kirby went on. The more time you hunt birds, the better my chance are. And I have an idea about where you got those binoculars. They belong to a friend, Hunter managed to say, but his mind was in a whirl as he crossed the road and followed the trail home. He slumped onto grandfather's bed. How does, did Kirby guess his secret? Nobody knew. Hunter began to go over in his mind what had happened a few weeks ago. The binoculars had been sitting on Mr. Clemson's desk. One Friday, Hunter had accidentally knocked them into the wastebasket. Nobody was in the room, but instead of taking them out, Hunter had covered them with paper. Later, he emptied the basket into the dumpster behind the school, and he slipped the glasses into his knapsack. He told himself that he was only going to borrow them and give them back later. By Monday, though, Mr. Clemson was missing the glasses. He searched and questioned, and the teacher remarked that they must have gone out with the trash. He would ask Tyson to look for them at the landfill. So that must have been how Kirby had figured out the glasses were missing. Today, Kirby put those pieces together. Would he tell anyone? Hunter realized the glasses were worth a lot of money, and he wished with all of his heart that he hadn't borrowed them. Well, he wouldn't use them anymore. He went out and hid them in the hole in the cedar tree. He would return them just as soon as he could figure out a way to return them without getting caught and being sent to jail. In the morning, Hunter was still worried. Solving the bicycle mystery didn't seem near as exciting, but he needed the money. Remembering the handicapped man on the 10-speed, he decided to stop at the police booth before meeting Rusty. The officer was on duty there, said no stolen bikes had been reported the day before. But I saw a man on a bike I thought was stolen, Hunter told him. It was a green 10-speed. The policeman checked his clipboard and shook his head. Hmm, nope, a 10-speed was stolen on Saturday, but not yesterday. To himself, Hunter thought, hmm, never on Sunday. That's three weeks in a row. I wonder where that handicapped guy got the green bike he was riding. He asked himself more questions and wrote down the latest details. As he went onto the beacon light, he was puzzling over the riddle of Sundays. If he could solve that, it might help to identify the thief. Rusty came bursting out of the hotel. What's new? He asked. Plenty, Hunter said. Let's go down by the water and I'll catch you up. Rusty groaned over the second disappearance of the man with the built-up shoe. Why was he on a different bike this time? Like Hunter, he was confused by the no thieves on no thefts on Sunday. He cheered when he heard that Jancy now had a bike to use and could go swimming with them. Hunter asked Rusty how his trip had gone. Not bad, the other boy said, but it got kind of boring. But on the way back, we had a ball. He reported that a well-known entertainer had performed for the crowd on the charter boat, doing all kinds of famous people's voices. He did Bob Hope, the president, Carol Burnett, so many, Rusty cried. We were all falling off our chairs laughing. He sounded and acted exactly like each one. I wish you could have heard him. If it was Jim Redding, I have heard him, Hunter said. How come? He's an islander, Hunter answered. He's away most of the time, but when, he home, when he's home, he puts on shows for us. 
The roof flies off when he mimics the fudgies. When Rusty asked, well, what do we do next? Hunter was ready with his plan. You've got to see the fort, he announced, and this is the perfect day for it. While you're inside looking at the exhibits, I will keep watch on the rented bikes outside. Leaving their wheels behind the library, they walked up the steep street toward the fort. They were joined by Greg pushing his bike. Annoyed, Hunter said, what is it with you, Greg, always tailing behind us? Turning red, the towhead answered, I just like to hang out with you. When he heard that Rusty was going to the fort, he said he would hang out with Hunter. Nope, Hunter replied, go get lost. I'm going to follow you, the boy said stubbornly. Try it, Hunter challenged him. He took Rusty aside to whisper that he would meet him at the parade ground about two hours from then. Rusty joined the tourists that were crowding up a ramp that led to the south gate of the fort. Many had left their bikes in the rack at the foot of the ramp. Across the street, there was a stone church with double doors. That was where Punter planned to keep watch. But he walked down Market Street with Greg tailing behind him. Suddenly, Hunter sprinted around the back of the church, dodging through trees and shrubs. He saw Greg drop his bike and come running after him. Quickly, though, Hunter circled the small building, popped inside the doors, and stopped them from swinging. Peeking through the crack, he could see the boy out on the sidewalk, looking up and down the street. His mouth gazed open in amazement. Hunter grinned and waited until Greg walked away. Through the glass in the upper part of the doors, he could watch the tourists leaving their bikes in the rack. He watched them carefully so he would know if a different person took the bike. There was so much to see that the two hours passed quickly. Soon it was time to meet Rusty. Hunter went up to the parade ground on the far side of the fort and stood by the gate, waiting. Suddenly, past the block house at the far end of the fort, he saw Greg's yellow head peering around. Like a shot, Hunter was after him, but by the time he got there, Greg was on his bike speeding toward, down toward Main Street. Why, he wondered, was this kid following him? What was he after? When West Rusty came out, he said, that's one of the best things I've ever seen. It was like being on a time clock and stepping out at different times when exciting things happened at the fort. Those life-size figures in costumes in the old-time settings were so cool. Hunter suggested they go down to one of the ferry docks and eat their sandwiches there. So they did, dangling their feet over the water and watching great ore boats loaded with grain and iron ore threading their way between Mackinac and Round Island, while smaller craft kept out of their path. There was a breeze that swept over the boys and waved the flags on the ferries going from the inland to the mainland, each one making a solemn ear-splitting toot as it approached or took off. When the boys finished eating, Hunter took out the notebook to bring his partner Rusty up to date. Out flew a tiny piece of paper. Hunter grabbed it. He was about to stuff it in with the lunch trash when suddenly he smoothed it out and bent over it. Rusty looked too. There was a message written in a childlike scribble. They didn't hunt for no bikes. All they done was swim. At the Grand Hotel bike shop, they asked about a cripple riding a bike. Maybe he is the thief from Greg. Hunter froze with fury. Greg was tailing them and reporting things to Kirby. Rusty asked, where did you get this? I found it when Kirby dropped it at dad's house. I picked it up to throw it away. How come Greg knew what you said to the man in the shop? Rusty wondered. Hunter answered, I think that Fink went in and talked to the guy after we left. Rusty leaped to his feet, his freckled face flaming. A spy? I'd like to mash that lousy kitty, yelled, jumping up and down angrily. One foot slipped off the edge of the rock and Rusty waved his arms but didn't gain his balance back. He went cartwheeling through the air and there was a big splash when he hit the water eight feet below. Hunter couldn't help his laughter when the redhead came to the surface. Well, that's one way to cool yourself off, he called. Rusty said nothing. He was weighted down by his jeans and his shoes and he began a slow swim toward the shore. Hunter picked up both of their backpacks and went to meet him. Together, they hurried to the beacon light, discussing what to do about Greg. Rusty got into dry things and checked his watch. Hey, it's still running, he said. It's time to go and get Chancy. Walking to the library for their bikes, Hunter remembered to tell Rusty about the figure he had seen running away from the haunted house. Gee, Rusty said enviously, kooky things happen at your place. I hope they happen tomorrow night, too, when I'm with you. See you later for another chapter.